Yeah, that is not a real Picasso. That is an Amazon printed Picasso. Do you feel you're a New Yorker? Are you like a New York born and bred? <laughs> yeah, I mean, not born and bred. Every once in a while, I still get very overwhelmed by the noises of the city and the amounts of people and the garbage. Mm-hmm. Um, but I am, I am, I, I consider myself to be a New Yorker, uh, an honorary New Yorker. I think, isn't the rule like six or seven years? I've been here since 2014, so. Hey, well, you're not doing bad. Yeah. No, I love, I love New York. I love I got a New York. few years on you, but um, yeah. I think it's really funny. My husband has a saying that New Yorkers are born all over the world. They're just going to find themselves here. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that there are people who come visit who feel at home right away, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, we're excited to hear about all of your activities. I have to tell you, you've got a lot going on. Yes, I've been lucky enough to have things going on during uh, the pandemic, which is just, I mean, I feel so lucky that I was able to, to work. I will say, you know, um, I have a lot of friends who primarily work in theater because um, I'm from the theater world. That's how I started. Mm. And, you know, I'm. These are people who like were paying their bills from theater and which is like an impossible thing to do. You know, that's to me is far superior to television and film actors. Like if you're able to just work that way and some of them are are friends of mine who have not worked at all in, in the arts during this time. And so they had to get really creative and I, um, have so much empathy and, uh, yeah, compassion for that experience. And I think that the fact, like, I think anyone who's been able to work in TV and film should count themselves extremely lucky and, and appreciate that, um, yeah. which, which I try and remind myself of that, you know, yeah, it, a lot of people haven't been able to work, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And like yeah. yourself, I've got fellow friends and colleagues that are all just sitting on the sidelines and waiting for it all to fully come back. And the tiny bit that comes back then also gets another hit. Oh, I know. Madness. And you're just like, you know what? 2022, it has to happen. It's got right. to happen. I was reading some on my Instagram feed. It said something about the number 22 and... I don't know, numerology and how it has to be a good year because those are good numbers together. And I mean, you know, who knows? It could be a load of crap, but I I, I chose to believe it. Oh, me too. (laughs) On that one. I'm like so superstitious. I'm like, yeah, I'm totally (laughs) going to hang on to all of that positivity. I'd love to pick up your comment there on Um, theatre. I know you studied in London Mm, and performed at the Shakespeare Globe. Tell me a little bit about that because you've transitioned hugely from that space. Yeah, I remember it quite well. I remember (laughs) living close enough to the Globe Theater that I walked across this bridge called the Millennial Millennium or Millennial Bridge um, past St. Paul's Cathedral. Being whatever, how old I was, 20 years old, I think I appreciated it, but much more in in, um, hindsight. You know, I... um, Oh, if I could go back for a day and and take that walk across the bridge, you know, which I know that I'll get to do at some point. A part part of my vision board is being able to do a play in the West End at some point in my life and, ah. and to actually work there, you know. Because I remember when I was, you know, a kid there, I would look at, I would go see those shows in the West End, and I would look at all of those older actors who had careers there, and it, it was just so so appealing. There's so many little bubbles of your life that I kind of want to talk about. And I think I'd like to kick off with obviously your recent success on your great show that Mindy, you produced with Mindy. Um, Tell me a little bit how you processed, okay, I just learned what my character role is. And yes, I'm going to be playing a, 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 I mean, I don't even know what you would say. Would you say you're a lesbian or would you just say I'm gay? How would you talk about that if you were going to talk about yourself in this character? Right. So I think, uh, yeah, gay would definitely be in there, but I think that would be, that has to be lower on the list. Do you know what I mean? Just because, um, you know, as a queer person myself, like that is definitely an experience and, and an identifier, but not the main one, you know? So mm-hmm. I think, first of all, I look at the age of the characters that I play because I play a wide variety of ages, um, as a person who looks young. And I think, you know, first and foremost, uh, it's like what you said. I'm I'm aware that I'm playing a character who is of a certain age, and most importantly, 
you know, as an actor, I always like to look at the story that I'm in. So it's not just about me. It's about what my role is in the story that this right. writer has told. And right. so it was very apparent to me that my character is a device for Leighton to come out. I mean, that's just a fact, right? right, right. But the how of, of how I choose to do that, that is up to me and the creator. And that's where the creativity comes in. And so I think for me, I was like, all right, I, I, my character is here to help Leighton come out of the closet, but how, and, and who is this character and, and how can we make her interesting? And, um, and what, why, what am I doing there? You know, I can't just be there to help Leighton come out. I have to have a reason for, for being, so I, those, these are all the questions that I was asking myself. And then of course, you know, how do I justify some of the behavior and those sorts of things? And just remembering that, you know, when you're 19, when you're 20, your impulse control is a little bit less. I had a, I had a a relationship in college that me. So the, okay. So the amount of time that Alicia and Leighton have to get to know each other to date and to break up is very condensed to, to, to put it mildly. I think it's in a course of over the course of a few months. Um, and before I judged that, I remembered when I was a sophomore in college and I had my first experience in love. And I think maybe it was a little longer, maybe a six month period, but it was fast right. and um, it was dramatic. And it was, but to me as a, as a young person, it felt so real and it felt so um, long and it felt like all of the steps were happening in real time. And so I, I remembered that how that felt for me. And then I gave the character of Alicia and Layton that the same respect that for them, even if they've been dating for three months, that heartbreak, that first heartbreak is so real. And it feels like the whole world is falling down because you have nothing else to compare it to, you right. know? And, and so when it ends, it's crushing. Right. And right. so I, I just, I tried really hard to always give the characters the benefit of the doubt. Right. Um, that no, and a lot of auth- auth- authenticity as well. I mean, and I say this as an adult because I feel myself as being ancient in this conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when I look at the young people, I, <laughs> with, <laughs> I kind yeah. of think, boy, where do they get this stuff from? Um, <laughs> and, and you kind of kind of uh, run it down these paths, and you're like, there is just so much going on um, that you think you think you know about somebody, and then all of a sudden they come out with all of this. It, all this stuff that's out there and that they've got yeah. access to and that they can tap into. Um, tell me how you feel social media is also influencing this. And then, and at what point did you kind of feel, yeah, I'm going to have my account. I'm going to make this uh, a, an area where, mm. where I do what, I mean, how do you select what you do in that space? I kind of grew up in the nineties um, into the two thousands into the, you know, the tech revolution and, and social media and I think I went from being a kid who felt very isolated from other people who look like me. You know, I grew up in a pretty much all white town, uh, leaning towards, you know, uh, you know, a Trump voting town. I mean, overall, um, or the majority. And, yeah. and so I think that I went from seeing that to then like coming into high school and college and, and like finding that my phone was actually this portal to information and like like-minded people and, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Facebook group called Subtle Asian Traits, but it was the fastest growing Facebook group of all time. And uh, I think an, the reason was because there were so many people who were looking for for these this information and this type of communicating that they couldn't find on cable TV, you know? Right. And so I look at social media as this incredible sort of transformative thing that happened where Um, you know, you started seeing YouTube channels where, you know, you'd see, I don't know, uh, a a young Indian American girl talking, doing impressions of her grandma and getting 3 million viewers. And then that turns into a TV show. And, and so I think that a lot of the diversifying of content would have, wouldn't have been possible without social media and without the internet. Um, and so, and so maybe I have a negative bias, I mean, a positive bias towards it. Um. But yeah, I, I largely look at it as an incredible thing that also you have to be careful of. Purely on a, on a work front, one of the most meaningful projects I ever did, it was called Usual Girls. It ended up uh, at the Roundabout Theater Company. Um, nice. It was basically an unknown playwright with a very sort of uh, early career director with, uh, at the time, very much not a celebrity actor, kind of putting this play out there that 
the city of, seemed to really respond to, those, the theater city. And I actually made that connection through Facebook. So this, this woman, Ming Pfeiffer, who is a playwright and screenwriter, she found me on Facebook and was like, hey, I met you at this Asian theater event. Do you want to be the lead of my play? Because I don't know too many other half Asian actresses. And I was like, sure. And then this tiny little thing turned into being not only an important career opportunity for me, but something of meaning. Just shifting gears, let's talk a little bit about your comedy um, (laughs) kind of genre that you love and you kind of um, almost uh, resonate with so well. Comedy is, in my opinion, way more difficult than than, uh, not comedy, to to, to put it very simply. Um, And so I think in terms of things like timing and all of that. There are some people who are comedians, which I don't necessarily think that I am. And I, I bow down to those people, but I think a lot of the roles I played, like Lily, for example, and Dash and Lily, a lot of the comedy there came out of like, uh, I think I, I love, you know, I have a sense of like the physical and, and my body in space. And so like, uh, Lily and good boys, for example, like I, I had a field day with being able to play high on Molly and jumping over the couch and those sorts of things. Like I really like making a fool of myself um, because I think that there's just so much humor in people's failings. And I've had the, I've had the great fortune of playing like a lot of flawed flawed characters like Lily and Dash and Lily. When I did the dance sequence um, at at the underground pub, you know, and I, I just got to lay it out all on the floor. Yeah. And so I think for me, comedy has been just a great intersection of, me making a fool of myself or me. I think that there's great humor in people really trying hard right. and, and then failing. And I just think as a person, that is, that is me. But, and you've touched on Dasha Lily, which I have to say is the, uh, the first um, uh, TV miniseries that I've watched with you actually, and that we fell in love with. My husband and I sat and watched it. We just heard oh. it. We love the, the kind of the, the storyline was so quaint. It was so... Mm-hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Was that something that you had some impact in or it's, mm. yeah, share some of the insights in, cause it is a really well executed. Dash and Lily was a prime example of writing that knew what genre it was in and right. did it really, really well, you yeah. know, and um, the cinematography, the direction, you know, it, it was, in my opinion, uh, everybody that I worked with did the best version of the thing that they were trying to do. Right. And so, yeah, I mean, getting to step into that, you know, as an actor, there's only so much you can do. Right. Um, and so you really can't be at the level you want to be unless you're surrounded by other people who are at that level. And when you are, you really want to bring your A game. Um, but yeah, my showrunner and, and writer of the series, Joe Trace, uh, he's a wonderful guy. And he was so open to hearing all my thoughts on, on Lily. And uh, uh, it, was, it was an extremely co- collaborative process. Major props to New York Moves. Click to sub- Oh, my God. This is terrible. <laughs> fire me. Fire me from this interview. Major props to New York Moves. Click to subscribe.